in the 17th chapter, and it says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them to a high mountain by themselves. And there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. And just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Sounds like a science fiction movie. And for people who struggle with belief that something can happen they've never experienced or seen for themselves, this can be something of a stumbling block. How can you believe things like this happen in our world? But if you've lived for very long, you know that truth is often stranger than fiction. And there's some very important truths to draw out of this interaction that the disciples had with Jesus in this moment. Jesus had just in the previous chapter explained to his disciples that he was going to embrace a cross. He was going to suffer and die and that he would be raised again. And if if you remember, he also told them, if you're going to follow me, you need to learn how to deny yourselves and take up your own cross and follow me. And he's just announced that that's the path that he is on. And, and now the, he takes them up to this mountaintop. And while he's there, he's surrounded by God's glory. Jesus had previously rejected false glory in the temptations. There are some people, when you think about it, the temptations were about the stuff you get as a result of glory. Like if you are a famous artist, there's a lot of things that come your way in life. If you're a famous athlete, you get all kinds of contracts. You live in the very best houses. You, you have more than one. If you're a famous actor, if, if you're a famous scientist, like all of these things, things come. And a lot of people want the fame so they can get the stuff. And so that was the temptation that, that Satan provided to Jesus. If you, if you, you can have the stuff, like this is a shortcut. And Jesus rejected all because Jesus wasn't after the stuff. Jesus loved and followed his father. And that's what he wanted. So now remember in this, in this whole gospel of Matthew, Matthew is writing as a Jewish believer to Jewish believers. And so there's little clues in the text and he doesn't make up details, but he does point them out. And so he tells us, uh, we also know in Exodus chapter 24, that Moses actually, before he went up the mountain where he's going to be, to meet with God, that he took three companions with him and look, Jesus is going up the mountain. And then he was addressed by God out of a cloud. And look, Jesus is being addressed by God out of a cloud. And after that experience, according to Exodus, the 34th chapter, Moses' face actually shines. And look, Jesus' face is shining. A shining face, shining clothes, a filled with light, a bright cloud. What is Matthew trying to tell us? And what he's trying to tell us is Jesus is the light of the world. That's who he is. Jesus is the expression of God. Now we know this from other places in scripture. For example, the author of Hebrews said this, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The son, listen to this, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Now in biblical history, when God's glory was demonstrated, when it was observable, it was too much for people. 
And it wasn't because that, that the glory was bad. In fact, glory kind of has a, a dual meaning. One has to do with light and the other has to do with weight. And, and the glory of God has a sense of significance about it. And so it, it's not as though when God's glory came on, it was a punishment to people who were there. It's just that their bodies couldn't hold up. For example, if you were to go out today, how many are glad we have sunshine? How many wasn't sure what that large glowing yellow object was in the sky? Okay, but we've got sunshine. And if you stared right into the sun for a long time, do you know what would happen? You would damage your optical nerves. And it's not because the sun is bad. It's because our eyes are not adequate to take that kind of brilliance in. The sun is the source of life on our planet but our eyes are inadequate to look at it for a long time. Now, a couple weeks ago, we looked at Peter's confession of who Jesus was. Now we're going to see God's confession of who Jesus is. And what does he say? This is my son whom I loved. With him I am well pleased. What is he saying? There's more to Jesus than meets the eye. And this is important. Jesus is not just the light of the world, He's also the light of Scripture. He's the light of the Word. Uh, if you've been around faith communities very long, you will know that so there are differences of opinion on lots of things. How many have noticed that, right? Uh, how do you baptize? Well, there's not complete agreement on that. How do you have communion? Not complete agreement about that. What kind of songs do you worship? Not complete agreement about that. What kind of instruments are you allowed to use? Not complete agreement about that. Who gets to stand up in the front of the room? Not complete agreement about that. Like there's lots of ways. And so everybody claims to have some authority, right? But what, what God is telling us is that Jesus is the final authority. So why does that matter? Because he is the way, let me put it this way, scripture points to Jesus, all the Old Testament points to him, but Jesus is also the way to interpret the scripture. That when we try to understand, particularly the Old Testament, without the lens of Jesus Christ, we often misunderstand and we make mistakes and we misuse God's Word. And so sometimes there are people who will find a passage in God's Word and they get very passionate about it and sometimes their language can be a little bit hostile and they come out and they're absolutely sure that they're right. But the question should be, how should we see that passage through the lens of Jesus? Because, for example, let's say you perceive someone as your enemy. Maybe they're on a different side of the political aisle. Maybe they're a different gender from you. Maybe they're a different ethnicity from you you. Maybe they're a different education from you. Maybe they have more or less than you. Whatever it is, we have all kinds of reasons that we see people differently and we could assume that they are an enemy of us. And you could find a passage in the Old Testament where God did something with enemies and go, that's it, that's it, that's it. That's what, I've got the right to do that. It's in the Bible. It's right here. But what does Jesus say about enemies? Love your enemies. Very different thing. So there's no shortage of voices. And a lot of times when we take wrong paths in our faith, it's because we're listening to somebody other than Jesus. What does Jesus have to say about those things? Now, Peter had been in a previous situation where he got corrected by Jesus. He wasn't desiring a bad thing. He just didn't want Jesus to go to the cross and, and Jesus corrected him and he wanted to protect Jesus. But, but now he's in another situation where they're up on this mountain and there's all this radiance and glory and, and there's Moses and Elijah and he doesn't want to leave. He just wants to stay. Like some of you after the service when you're in the glory of the donuts and the coffee. Yeah. And... Uh, he wants to stay. But listen to this. Christianity is not about doing things for Jesus. It's about letting Jesus speak and doing what he says. And that's different. Peter has an idea. Well, let's build three shelters, three tents. Let's make this a camp out. Let's stay a long time. And, and that was not a good idea. It was such a bad idea that God had to correct it himself. That's how you know you really messed up. 
God from heaven. So Peter recommends three tabernacles. He wants to stay up there, and, and he wants these shelters. And, and what, what happens? God doesn't wait for Peter to stop talking. It says, wow, he was still speaking. <laughs> God interrupted him. Because if God waited for Peter to stop talking, they would both still be there. <laughs> Peter talked. God doesn't wait. While he's still speaking, this bright cloud envelops them all. And God says, this is my son, whom I love. In him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now this cloud has been seen before in the Old Testament. For example, in Exodus chapter 40, and the wanderings of Israel coming out of bondage in Egypt, and all the way to the Promised Land, there was this bright cloud that led them when, they were, uh, when it was time for them to move in the wilderness. It was a bright cloud by day, and it was a pillar of fire by night. And even in 1 Kings chapter 8, when they built the first temple, what we see is that there, the cloud, the, the, this bright glory of God fills the temple, and the result is that the priests can't continue doing their ministry. They actually flee the facility because it's so great and it's so glorious. And now a bright cloud envelops Jesus and Moses and Elijah and the disciples. And in the Gospels, we know that God only speaks out loud audibly twice. Once at Jesus' baptism and once here, and both times he says the exact same thing. Why does he do that? Because he's wanting us to know the most important thing about Jesus. He wants, he wants us to know who Jesus is to him so that Jesus can be that to us. That's what he wants. Listen to him. God directs complete attention to Jesus. So here's a little... Um, piece of advice. If you want to hear God, listen to Jesus. Listen to Jesus. Now, Jesus doesn't replace the Father. He actually reveals the Father. And Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. Uh, Moses was considered the lawgiver and the most uh, powerful person in the Old Testament. And Elijah was considered the greatest of the prophets. And so Peter, James, and John, they represent the law and the prophets, and Peter, James, and John represents church leadership. And what does God say to the law and to the prophets and to the leaders of the church? Listen to him. Jesus is the key to interpreting scripture. Jesus never degrades scripture. He never denies scripture, but he does see it differently than other people. And so we need to listen to Jesus to know how to understand scripture. When the church gets off track, it's usually because we're listening to somebody other than Jesus. So Moses actually foretold that Jesus would come. You can find this in Deuteronomy 18. He said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. Why is this important? Because when we listen to Jesus, we come down the mountain and into our world. When we listen to Jesus, Peter wanted to stay. God says, listen to him. And now they're going to come down the mountain. In the Old Testament, that bright cloud of glory, of God's glory, when it came down, it absolutely terrified people. And the disciples, when it came down, they go right down on their face and they are absolutely terrified. And here's what you need to know. Jesus doesn't shine to show off. Jesus shines to show us the way. He wants us to, to understand something that we didn't understand before. So God just said, listen to him. And what are the first words Jesus says to his disciples after God just said, listen to him? He says, don't be afraid. How much do we need to hear those words today? How much do we need to hear those words today? And when they looked up, only Jesus was left. In this passage, we see something about how Jesus thinks about this glory and this authority and this power. And he tells his disciples this. He tells them, don't mention this to anybody until after my death and resurrection. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke all include this story in their Gospels. 
Now something interesting happens. In Matthew 17, it says the disciples asked him, so they're, they're going down the mountain now, and the disciples asked him, why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus replied, to be sure Elijah comes and will restore all things, but I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man, that's how Jesus refers to himself, is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. So Jesus are coming down the mountain with the disciples, and the disciples have a question, and they ask the right person. That's a really good thing. And their understanding is that someone who represented a prophetic office like Elijah was going to precede Jesus. And if Jesus is the Messiah, wasn't Elijah supposed to come first? And this prophecy actually comes out of the last book of the Old Testament. It's a book called Malachi, and this is what it says. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents. How many think that would be a pretty good thing today too? Yeah? And, and to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. The disciples are asking their questions to the right person, and Jesus says, to be sure, he comes and sets all things right. So the question is, how did he do that? How did Elijah, being represented by John the Baptist, set all things right? And the answer was, he pointed to Jesus. When Jesus comes for baptism, he says these words, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In the Jewish faith, if you had committed a sin and you wanted to be at peace with God, you would bring a lamb into the worship space, and that lamb would be sacrificed. And what would happen is that your sin would go onto the lamb, and then the lamb would pay the price for your sin, and you could walk away at peace with God. And what John the Baptist says is, this is the lamb who will be sacrificed, and all the sins of the world will come on him, so that all of us can be at peace with God. Isn't that a wonderful thing? To be at peace with God. How, how many are also glad you didn't have to bring an animal in here this morning? Yeah. Unless, of course, you did. Um, so he, he points everyone to Jesus. Um, and Jesus said, they didn't recognize John, and they won't recognize me. And the question is, why won't they recognize either one of them? And it's because people have preconceived ideas about how prophecy is going to be fulfilled. John suffered, and Jesus is going to suffer. And in our world, if you're suffering, you're not considered important. You're not considered credible. You're not listened to. And so they missed what John the Baptist was doing. And many people have missed what Jesus was doing. And he's, he's, he's briefly seen here for a minute. Has anybody uh, seen some of the images of the Webb telescope? They are stunning. I can't believe how phenomenal those images are. They, I mean, if you, if you haven't seen any, just when you, you go home, Google web telescope images, and they're absolutely stunning. There, there is a kind of artistry and beauty in our universe I had no idea existed. And here's what's true. If you went up there in some kind of miraculous little spacesuit and you were standing right next to where the Hubble, tel or floating right next to where the Hubble telescope, or not the Hubble, the web telescope is, and you were looking, you wouldn't see what that telescope sees. Because the bandwidth of the light waves we are able to see are limited in our human vision. And the Webb telescope can see a lot more. And then what it's doing is it's seeing those light waves, and then it's translating and giving us light waves that we can see to show it how it looks if we could see beyond that. And this is what's happening on the Mount of Transfiguration. The disciples' eyes are being opened. And they're seeing Jesus for who he really is. And Jesus tells us, believe it or not, you are also bearers of God's glory. In Matthew 5, he would say, you are the light of the world. I'm going to ask worship team to come out.
In Matthew 13, he would say, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father, whoever has ears to hear. Let them hear. You are also a light. You are also a bearer of God's glory. And maybe you don't even recognize that in yourself because people didn't recognize it in John or in Jesus. But we bear something of God's glory. There was a prayer that Jesus prayed. Somebody says, well, I thought God doesn't... God doesn't share his glory with anyone. That's written in Isaiah, and the meaning of that, he doesn't share his glory with idols. But listen to what Jesus said in John 17. My prayer is not for them alone, his disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us that the world may believe that you have sent me. Listen to this. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be the one, they may be one as we are. This mountain experience is very different from another experience Jesus will have on a hill. In this mountain, his clothes are shining white. On another hill, his clothes will be stripped away. On this mountain, he's surrounded one side by Moses and the other side by Elijah. On that other hill, he's going to be, have thieves on either side. On this mountain, a bright cloud covers him. On that hill, darkness will descend. And people wonder, how can that be? And here's what we need to learn. You can learn to see the glory in the cross, and you can learn to see the cross in glory. And when we do that, it's amazing how much we begin to understand of what God is doing in our world. Darkness does not snuff out the light. I know it appears to you that there is no light, but if the bandwidth of your eyes were just a little bit wider, if you could see just a little bit more, everywhere you go, you are a bearer of something of God's glory, and you're bringing light, and you're bringing hope, and you're bringing peace wherever it is you go. And sometimes we get in circumstances that we want out of. I want to get away from this thing. But maybe God has created a divine appointment that someone who's the bearer of his glory would go into that home, into that classroom, into that neighborhood, and that out of that glory, somebody would begin to see who Jesus really is. Would you bow your heads this morning? First question for you is, who is Jesus to you? Is he just an interesting teacher? If you kind of put him on par with other voices in the world? What God would recommend to you is that you listen to him. It's amazing how often that people who are curious about spiritual things won't actually listen to what Jesus says because they assume it's not any different or not very important. But listen to him. And then the second question is, do you see yourself as a bearer of glory in our world? Because you are. Where you walk, the light of his glory shines within you and emanates from you. We have not come to stay on the mountain. We have come to bring the glory of God into a broken world. So Father, help us bear your glory well. In Jesus' name, amen.